So here's the, the general growth cycle of a forest, uh, just in terms of, of the amount of wood that the trees put on as a forest. So at, at a young age, it grows really quickly, and, and the rate of growth actually increases uh, till kind of middle age here. And then the amount of wood it puts on each year, not just the thickness of the ring, but the amount of wood as a, a total, uh, starts to slow down, slow down, slow down, until at some point it just kind of stagnates almost, like I, I mentioned earlier. So the, one of the, the drawbacks of having a very mature forest, if you're looking at it purely from an economical standpoint, is that you're no longer adding very much wood each year. And I'm not sure if I included, I didn't include the other slide, but there's a, actually a point somewhere around here uh, where the, the amount of wood you're putting on each year becomes uh, small enough that it makes sense to just to harvest and start from scratch. So you're, you're, the amount of wood you're growing on that acre of land is, is higher again. Um, so once you pass that point, you, your economic value from the land is limited to some extent. So just another thing to consider. Okay, so this is the planning process. <laughs> uh, and planning is essential to prevent situations like this, but also on a much bigger scale, uh, even larger disasters. So, you know, this is, a, this is a horrible thing to happen to your truck, uh, but it is fixable within the course of you know, a month or a year, hopefully. Um, uh, on the other hand, your forest land is a much longer term uh, consideration in this. If you make a mistake when you're harvesting your forest land, it could be something that uh, you can see the effects of for decades down the line. So you definitely make, want to make sure that you have a good plan in place before you take any actions. And if you are going to sell timber, you want to make sure you do it when it best accomplishes your goals, when it helps you get to your goals in the most efficient manner, not just because someone made you an offer. So, uh, occasionally loggers will knock on landowners' doors and say, I see you have some nice trees there, I'll give you $5,000 for them. And you know, the little old lady who answers the door says, $5,000, that's wonderful, please, go away. But that's not always what the trees are worth. It could have been worth $20,000. Um, and she didn't know that because she didn't take the proper steps. Uh, let's see. Well, the you know, exception to that is if it's an offer, we can't refuse. But hopefully that's not the case. <laughs> All right, so uh, the ideal tool for creating this plan is called a forest stewardship plan. And this is a plan uh, created and signed off on by a licensed state forester. Uh, and I'll talk about different kind of foresters are out there in a second. Uh, one of them is a DNR or a county forester. And they can help you uh, write a stewardship plan. They do charge for this service, but it's subsidized, so it's less than if you went to a private consultant. And there's just a, what the prices might look like. They could be a little higher now. So the idea here is that you pay a little money now. Uh, it does cost something to do this. Uh, although I, I should say there are, pl there are programs out there that help you pay even for the planning process. Uh, both from the state and from the federal level. And this should help you get a lot of money later. Uh, and I'll show you some numbers in a second, some example numbers. So there are actually three types of foresters. That public forester is the type I just mentioned who works for the state, DNR, Forest Service. Uh, but they work in the county, so you hear them called county forester. Um, they develop forest stewardship plans, and they can give you advice even if they're not going to... Uh, write a plan and that advice is free that you can come out to your land. They generally won't work on acre um, parcels that are less than 10 acres because they're just so strapped for um, people power. And they, they can't get involved in any commercial timber sales. Uh, so they would be just for the planning process. If you are going to sell timber or if you'd rather um, work with someone not employed by the state for whatever reason, uh, a consultant forester might be the right option for you. Uh, they're an independent forester, they're an independent agent. When you hire them, they become your agent working for you. Um, and usually they work on a commission or fee basis. They can also write a forest stewardship plan for you. And they can help you uh, complete a timber harvest. And I'll talk about why that's important in a second. 
The third type is an industrial or procurement forester. And they're employed by a mill. Their job is to go out and find wood for the mill, uh, to supply the mill. Uh, they are not working for you. They are working for the mill. That doesn't mean that they're going to lead you astray because generally they want to develop uh, a good long-term working relationship with landowners so that they're welcome to come back and buy more timber in the future. Um, occasionally, you know, there may be one out there who is just trying to get as much high-value timber as possible. So that's something you want to be careful of, and that's one advantage of hiring a consultant forester instead because you know that they are working for you. Okay, so you have your plan, you have your forester. Now, how are you going to actually make change on the land? Well, there's a do-nothing approach, which we talked about. Uh, there's planting trees and plants, which I'm not going to dwell on, but that is one way to um, change things. And then there's removing trees and plants. So, as we mentioned, uh, composition will change, as Bono said, with or without you. Um, and for, these are all the reasons that that happens. Um, And then planting trees, you can plant mass trees or sources of food for wildlife. You can plant flowering trees to make things look prettier or timber trees to uh, increase the timber value of the, of the forest. And then removing trees, you can prune, spray, or cut. So different kinds of cutting. There's a whole array of options here. Uh, thinning is a, a term that just means you're removing some trees and leaving others. Um, and there's different types of thinning. There's crop tree release, where you're picking out the trees that you want to mature and you're removing the competition for those trees. There's selection, where you're taking out just one or a group of trees. Um, and you don't have to really stick to any one of these. You can mix them up, and really, when you mix up different types of harvesting, uh, that's what tends to give you the most diversity in plant species and therefore the most diversity in habitat types and diversity in wildlife species. Uh, so you might consider taking out a group of trees here, uh, thinning out individual trees over here, and the, the idea in thinning in general is to just let more light uh, into the forest. And sometimes it's just so the crop trees that you want to grow faster and stronger can have that extra light. But if you're managing for wildlife habitat, a lot of it's about allowing that light to hit the forest floor and create that undergrowth, that understory level of vegetation that is often the limiting factor, especially in terms of uh, the uh, woodcock and, and quail. Um, so shelter wood is kind of a closer to a clear cut, uh, but you're still leaving some shelter on the grounds and some shade. And then seed tree is more like a clear cut with just occasional trees to provide the seed source. Then we have the clear cut. So a little more about the clear cut. Uh, it's definitely a high impact. Uh, you're having a lot of machinery in there and out of there, um, doing many passes over the ground. Generally, you have some exposed mineral soil, which in some ways mimics that natural disaster that um, is not very frequent where we live. Uh, that exposed mineral soil is good for germination of new seeds, uh, both seeds that fall in and exposing seeds in the seed bank. Uh, it does increase the, the potential for erosion. Now, Maryland has some pretty strict laws about erosion control, and usually erosion is not a problem when your lodger does a good job of following the best management practices. And your forester can help make sure that that happens. Uh, so this creates or maintains an even age stand. So you're not going to have a young tree next to an old tree next to a medium tree. Um, just which isn't necessarily a bad thing. Uh, and it creates that early successional habitat that we've been talking about all day. So there's a lot of great things that go on when you have a clear cut. And it is very high efficiency. So you, you're not paying your logger those, uh, or the logger's not charging you um, for that transportation to and from your site every five years or so. And there's a, a clear cut. This is just off of 301. Um, not too far from Centerville. And this is a little unusual. Can anyone tell why? Is anything missing from here? All the tops. Yeah. There's no slash or tops here. And that's because um, 
the, they actually collected all those and ground them and used them for mulch. I think it was for mulch. Uh, so that's unusual. Usually you would see that kind of messy uh, branches in the tops, and, and that's really a lot of times what people object to with a clear cut. So the funny thing was, this is right on 301, so all kinds of traffic going by. And generally, when there's a, a harvest on a highway in this area, planning and zoning or some county office somewhere gets all kinds of phone calls uh, complaining. Well, that never happened here. Uh, and it's probably just because it looks so clean, or maybe people figured that it was going to be built upon and there was nothing they could do about it, or it was just more normal to see a site that was cleared for building. But in any case, um, it was very aesthetically acceptable to the public. Um, but it was also missing some of the, the wildlife value because that those slash components actually add some of the structure that's missing. This is just one year later after that, and you can see how quickly the site regenerates. Um, what you can't really make out is that there are pine seedlings in here. This is a another reason this was kind of an unusual harvest is that the landowner decided to convert the land from hardwood species to uh, loblolly pine. So they actually planted pine seedlings throughout here, and uh, a little while after this photo was taken, they came through and sprayed to, to uh, kill back the hardwood species and allow the softwood species to, to uh, outcompete them. But this is just intended to show how quickly that site can regenerate and uh, become lush again and create that early successional habitat. So uh, one concept I wanted to talk on was, uh, talk, uh, touch on was uh, sustained yield. In the, this, this is one method for ensuring that uh, a landscape has uh, uh, that variety of successional levels, successional uh, types that is required for really good habitat. Now, I doubt that many of you have a thousand acres of forest to work with, but this is an example. And even if one landowner doesn't have a thousand acres, um, as long as this is going on on the landscape scale among many neighbors, uh, you can still get some of the same benefits. So each of these blocks is uh, 10 acres, I believe, yeah. Uh, and this is a 50 year rotation. So every year, you know, uh, yeah, this is really intense. The, m most landowners probably wouldn't want to harvest every year. But, for example, uh, you could harvest 20 acres every year, which would mean every year you have a little bit of income. You didn't have to wait uh, 50 years and get all the income at once, which is a benefit. And it is high intensity. But the idea is, over that 50-year rotation, you're constantly uh, creating new habitat types, the, the one that you harvested eight years ago is um, coming out of that young forest stage, but you still have plenty of the young forest stage in these other blocks. And this makes for lots of edge, uh, maximum diversity. It's great for edge species. Uh, now, again, there's this balance because uh, the species we're talking about today generally like edge. They need a lot of different habitats next to each other. But there are some some drawbacks to edge in general. Um, anyone know what FIDs are? Yeah, forest interior dwelling species. And they generally refer to a group of neotropical songbirds. And these songbirds are an umbrella species. They uh, kind of represent all the species that need interior forest habitat. So this mosaic landscape isn't really that good for FIDs. Uh, by Maryland's definition, I think it's at least 10 acres uh, and at least 300 feet from the edge. So each of these blocks has a little bit of, uh, or actually, yeah, maybe a little bit of this interior forest habitat, but not very much. So you're managing for the, the edge species, the quail and the uh, woodcock, but it's to the exclusion of this other group. So it's just something to think about. And we heard about hard edge and soft edge. Generally, soft edge is better because you have a lot of diversity in a small amount of space. Uh, but here's an alternative, a little less intensive, uh, a little less diverse, but still have a, um, a good amount of diversity. And you, you don't have to go in there every year and harvest something. 
uh, and you're still getting a lot of uh, different types of, of habitat.